So when we left off with this unfolding drama of atomic weights, we were asking the question, if the total mass of the protons and electrons in a chlorine atom only add up to about 17 AMUs, but the atomic weight of chlorine is 35 and a half, then where do the remaining AMUs come from? Well, now the story does get just a bit more complicated. You may have noticed that I keep talking about the average weight of a chlorine atom. Why average? Why not just say the weight of a chlorine atom? Well, that's because not all chlorine atoms are the same. What? Not the same? You did lie to me. You said that all chlorine atoms had to have 17 protons in their nuclei and 17 electrons outside their nuclei. Yes, and they do. But as you may already have realized, there is another particle in the nucleus that we haven't accounted for, namely the neutron. And except for most hydrogen atoms, nuclei of all elements contain neutrons. And these neutrons provide the missing mass that we've been trying to account for. So it turns out that most elements consist of more than one kind of atom. Most consist of anywhere from two to several different kinds of atoms that differ from each other and that their nuclei contain different numbers of neutrons. Atoms of the same element that differ in the number of neutrons are called isotopes. Almost all chlorine atoms consist of only two isotopes. One is called chlorine-35, which comprises about 75.77% of all chlorine atoms. The other is chlorine-37, which comprises about 24.23% of all chlorine atoms. The numbers 35 and 37 refer to what are called the mass numbers of these two isotopes. There are two different ways to define the mass number for a given isotope. The most useful definition is that the mass number is simply the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of that particular isotope. But it can also be defined as the mass of that particular isotope rounded off to the nearest whole number. Let's see why these two definitions generally coincide. We know that a proton has a mass of about 1 AMU, a neutron has a mass of about 1 AMU, and the mass of an electron is so small it can essentially be ignored. So let's suppose we had an atom of chlorine that contains 17 protons, 17 electrons, and 18 neutrons. The 17 protons would have a total mass of a little over 17 AMUs. The mass of the 17 electrons can be ignored because their mass is too small to worry about. And the 18 neutrons would have a total mass of a little over 18 AMUs. If we actually wanted to include decimal places, we could calculate the theoretical mass of chlorine-35 the following way. The 17 protons would have a total mass of about 17 times 1.0073 AMUs, or 17.1241 AMUs. The 17 electrons would have a total mass of about 17 times 0 0.00055, or 0 0.00935 AMUs, and the 18 neutrons would have a total mass of about 18 times 1.0087 or 18.1566 AMUs. That would give us a total mass of about 35.29005 AMUs, which, when rounded off to the nearest whole number, comes out to be 35, which is equal to the total number of protons and neutrons. Now, if you're really thinking, you may say that if we took some later element that has a lot more protons, neutrons, and electrons, we could pretty easily get a total mass that would in fact not round off to be equal to the total number of protons and neutrons. If you're ambitious, try this with some isotope of some heavy element near the end of the periodic table, perhaps something like uranium, element number 92, with a mass number of perhaps 238. You'll find that the theoretical mass that you calculate actually comes out to be pretty close to 240 rather than 238. So how can I say that the mass number is the mass of the isotope rounded off to the nearest whole number?
Well, I really don't want to get involved in a lengthy discussion of this effect, but it turns out that when a nucleus is formed from its individual protons and neutrons, it actually weighs less than the sum of the individual particles from which it is made. Now, that may sound ridiculous, but it actually has to do with Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. Believe me, I'm not trying to confuse or impress you, but when a nucleus is formed from its individual protons and neutrons, a tremendous amount of energy is released. Einstein said, and it has been proven, that when something loses energy, it actually weighs less. Losing energy is kind of like the same thing as losing mass. We don't notice this in our everyday lives because to calculate how much less something weighs when it loses some energy, you have to divide the energy released by c squared. c is the velocity of light, which is a huge number, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Squaring that makes it 9 times 10 to the 16th. And when you divide something by 9 times 10 to the 16th, you get a pretty small answer. So small that we never notice this effect in our daily lives. But nuclear processes involve so much energy that this effect is observable. So as I said, when a nucleus is formed from its protons and neutrons, so much energy is released that it will actually weigh less than what you might calculate it to weigh. And adding in this effect makes our previous statement valid. The mass number of an isotope is equal to the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of that isotope. There is a standard way of representing a particular isotope. Let's look at an example. Chlorine 35 would be written this way. We write the atomic number and the mass number for the isotope before its symbol. We write the atomic number as a subscript and the mass number as a superscript. And the correct symbol for chlorine 37 would be, stop the video, back it up if necessary, and go over this if that isn't quite clear just yet. And if we happen to be talking about an ion, the charge on the ion, as we have already seen, is written as a superscript that appears after the symbol for the isotope. So let's suppose we had a negatively charged chloride ion, a chloride ion made of chlorine 37. We would represent it the following way. And once we understand this notation, we can then determine how many protons, neutrons, and electrons there would be in this ion. Let's do that. Since this ion has an atomic number of 17, we know it has to contain 17 protons. Since it has a charge of minus 1, we know that it has, it has to contain one more electron than proton. So it contains 18 electrons. And the mass number is 37, which means that it contains a total of 37 protons and neutrons. Since we know it contains 17 protons, it must therefore contain 37 minus 17 or 20 neutrons. Let's try another for practice. Pause the video again and try to determine how many protons, electrons, and neutrons would be contained in this isotope of strontium. Strontium can be located in the second column of your periodic table. Strontium is element number 38. Since its atomic number is 38, we know one thing for certain. Its nucleus contains 38 protons. But since it is a plus 2 ion, it has lost 2 electrons, which means that it contains 2 less electrons than protons. This means that it only has 36 electrons. The mass number is 87, which means that it contains a total of 87 protons plus neutrons. Since it has 38 protons, it must contain 87 minus 38, or 49 neutrons. There are several practice problems designed to help you sharpen your skill in the workbook that accompanies these videos. Okay, back to chlorine. Been a long time getting around to answering our original question of what the atomic weight of an element actually represents.
If you remember, we said that the atomic weight represented the average weight of a chlorine atom. Perhaps now you can see why we use the word average. We use the word average because not all chlorine atoms are the same. Chlorine 35 has a mass of around 35 AMUs, while chlorine 37 has a mass of around 37 AMUs. And as we saw, chlorine 35 happens to be much more abundant than chlorine 37, roughly 75% to 25%. Since there are essentially only two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37, and since chlorine 35 is much more abundant than chlorine 37, we know that the average atomic weight of chlorine should come out to be closer to 35 than 37. And it does. The atomic weight of chlorine is about 35.5. Now we are finally ready to take a good look at our periodic table and see what it basically tells us and how we might use it. As you may already know, the periodic table is an arrangement of the elements into what are called chemical families. The vertical columns are in fact called families or groups. The horizontal rows are actually called rows or periods. There are also some broader divisions which I'd like to cover first. The two major groups of elements are metals and nonmetals. You notice a zigzaggy staircase-like line on the right side of the table? The elements to the left of this line, as well as the elements in the two rows placed below the bulk of the table, are basically all metals. Most of the elements to the right of the staircase line are nonmetals. There are a lot more metals than nonmetals. And here is where we can illustrate the power of organizing elements into a periodic table. Suppose no such organization existed you would then be forced to try and memorize properties for each individual element that you might want to say something about. It would be like trying to memorize those lists of numbers that we talked about in the first lecture. But suppose you want to be able to say something rational about an element like iron or gold or sodium or copper, something that had a high probability of being correct. These elements are all metals. We know that because of where they appear on the periodic table. And rather than having to memorize the properties of each element, we can make generalizations. Metals in general have the following properties. But before we list these properties, I do feel compelled to make a qualifying statement. By looking at the periodic table, we can see that there are a lot of elements that are classified as being metals. And as you might surmise, their properties really vary quite a bit. Some, like those in the first column, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, are highly reactive. I mean, so much that they react explosively if they come in contact with water. Others, like platinum or gold, are quite unreactive and are used in jewelry, something that we obviously wouldn't want to undergo a chemical reaction while we're wearing it. So don't take the list we're going to discuss too literally as if every single metal will exhibit all of these properties. These are generalizations. And is true as, and as is true of most generalizations, there often are many exceptions. But we can say that if something is a metal, there is a good probability that it will exhibit all or most of the following properties. If you polish the surface of a metal, it will generally be quite shiny. We call that lustrous. Often the actual surface of a metal will look dull simply because it has reacted with oxygen from the air to form a coating of an oxide compound. But when clean, it will probably be rather shiny. Metals also tend to be very good conductors of heat and electricity. That's why you don't hold on to one end of a fork when the other end is in a fire. And that's why the wiring in your house is likely made of copper and why you don't stick a knife into an electrical outlet. Metals also tend to be malleable and ductile. Malleable means that you can hammer them into thin sheets without having them shatter. And ductile means that they can be drawn into wires. Both really are due to the same general property. 
Metals can be shaped and formed. They do not tend to shatter under stress. And when metals react chemically, they tend to lose electrons to form positive ions. This is the one property that really is most consistent across this entire group of elements. Some books will also say that metals have high densities and high melting points. And I suppose that's generally true, but there are some pretty extreme exceptions. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature, and lithium is the, has the lowest density of any solid element. And if you know the properties of metals, you know the properties of nonmetals. These are just opposite properties of the metals. Nonmetals tend to be dull in appearance, do not conduct heat or electricity very well, are not malleable or ductile. Instead, they tend to shatter if you hammer them. And when they form ions, they tend to form negative ions rather than positive ions, anions rather than cations. And then there are some ordinary elements that just don't seem to, to fit our classification scheme. They have some of the properties of metals and some of the properties of nonmetals. We call these elements metalloids. They reside just to the right of the staircase line. Different books and websites will offer up slightly differing lists of which elements are actually included in this group. But silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium always seem to be included, with boron, astatine, and sometimes polonium appearing on the list as well. Once again, I feel compelled to digress for a moment for two reasons that I think may prove useful not only in chemistry, but in life. The first has to do with thinking. Thinking that you know something about something when all you have learned is a name or a word. When I ask students, if I were to ask you, why is it possible to hammer metals into thin sheets? The answer that is almost always offered up, often with great pride at knowing the answer, is because they are malleable. Now, what does that mean? Ask the same student what malleable means, and he'll tell you that it means you can hammer something into a thin sheet. So the student has really said that you can hammer metals into thin sheets because you can hammer them into thin sheets. Knowing the name for something doesn't mean that you know anything about it. But somehow or other, it always makes us feel as if we do. I have even seen these kinds of ridiculous answers appearing on examinations. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't know anything about why metals can be hammered into thin sheets. And we're not actually going to be explaining this in these videos, which is fine. Just try to realize when you actually know something about something and when all you have really learned is just a term or a name. The second thing is how we tend to think our classification schemes somehow or other are the truth and things that don't fit them are in some way odd or deficient. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no metals or nonmetals. What? You just said there were. Of course. What I mean by that is that all that exists are elements with different properties. We created the concept of metals and nonmetals. The elements don't have to fit whatever classification scheme we tried to think up. I have often found students talking about metalloids as if there were something wrong with them. Why aren't they metals or nonmetals? Why can't they behave? Why do they have to be an exception? Well, they aren't exceptions to anything significant. They are just exceptions to the scheme that we decided to draw up. But after we take the time and make the effort to design a classification scheme, for some psychological reason, we tend to expect nature to obey our scheme. That's really kind of silly when you think of it. Now, let's take a broad look at the overall structure of the periodic table. There are four main sections the way most periodic tables are laid out. There are two columns of elements on the left side that kind of form a group. 
There are six Collins elements on the right side that kind of form another separate group. There are ten shorter columns of elements in the middle. And there are two rows of 14 elements kind of separated and placed below the main table itself. Now, please, don't think that there is anything odd or wrong with the elements in these last two rows. Putting them at the bottom makes it look as if they were exiled or something. I mean, they could have been put into the heart of the table. But it would have made the table too inconveniently wide. So they were just placed at the bottom. These two rows or periods are called the inner transition elements, a fairly useless piece of information, since we won't be talking about these elements. But a name student somehow seemed to be expected to know. I'm not sure exactly why. The rows of 10 elements in the middle of the table are called transition elements or transition metals. They are all metals and include most of the elements that students will name from memory if called upon to name some metals, things like copper, iron, gold, silver, and zinc. I think they call them transition elements because they take us in transit from the extremely metallic elements found at the extreme left of the table to the non-metals on the right. The first two columns and the last six columns are often called the representative elements or the main group elements. Let's take a close look at these families. The first column in the periodic table consists of the elements lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. These elements constitute what are called the alkali metals. These are all highly reactive metals, so reactive that they are never found free in nature. They are always combined with some other element, often oxygen. The most useful thing you can probably extract and remember about this family is that when they combine with other elements, they form plus one ions. This is something that will be good to remember later in the course. The second column in the periodic table contains what are called the alkaline earths or alkaline earth metals. These will be beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. When they undergo chemical reactions, they form plus two ions. Also a good thing to remember later in this course. The far right-hand column of the periodic table, the family consisting of helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, are called the noble gases. They are extremely stable elements that form a relatively limited number of compounds. Interestingly enough, this entire family was for many years called the inert gases. When I was in high school, I was taught that these elements could never form any chemical compounds, and I believed it. I suppose if you would have asked me why they didn't form any compounds, I would have answered, well, they didn't form any compounds because they were inert, making the error we just talked about. That may even have been the correct answer on one of our exams. But as early as 1933, a great chemist by the name of Linus Pauling had actually predicted that compounds of at least some of these elements could be synthesized. And by 1962, they had. Chemists have since created many compounds of argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. Although synthesizing many of these is not in general an easy thing to do. No compounds of helium or neon, to the best of my knowledge, have yet been created. So at a practical level, we can consider the noble gas family of elements to represent a group of elements that have little tendency to combine with other elements, although they can and have been made to do so, at least some of them. The family just to the left of the noble gases, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine, are called the halogens. They are also very reactive chemicals and quite dangerous. They form both molecular and ionic compounds. When they form ions, they almost always form simple minus one ions like F minus, Cl minus, Br minus, or I minus. Some exceptions do exist, but you probably won't encounter any of them. And to the left of them is the family consisting of oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, and polonium. This family is called the chalcogens. They form a lot of molecular compounds. I believe that with the exception of some of the noble gases, every element in the periodic table combines with oxygen. When they form ionic compounds, they tend to form ions with a charge of minus two. The next family over is simply called the nitrogen family. 
by far they mostly form molecular compounds. Nitrogen and phosphorus do, however, form some ionic compounds where they exist as minus three ions. By the time you reach the bottom of the family with bismuth, you actually have an element that is classified as a metal and typically forms ions with a positive charge. Of course, I mean, we could keep talking about the periodic table forever. I mean, after all, it contains every known element. So in principle, I guess if you wanted to cover everything, you'd have to talk about all the chemistry of all the elements. That's not our purpose today or in this series of lectures. But this brief overview of the periodic table should provide you with at least a basic understanding of its general structure, its major families, and some of the most important properties associated with each family and each general type of element. But there is one last thing we need to accomplish before the next lecture. We've talked about atomic weights, the relative weights of the atoms of different elements. If I know the atomic weights of the atoms in a molecular substance, I can then calculate the relative weights of different molecules or formula units. These are called molecular weights or formula weights. For example, suppose I wanted to calculate the molecular weight of a water molecule. The formula for a water molecule tells me that it contains two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. The atomic weight of hydrogen is 1.0, so the two hydrogens would weigh a total of 2.0 AMUs. There is one oxygen atom in a molecule of water. Oxygen has an atomic weight of 16.0. So this would add another 16.0 AMUs to the weight, giving me a total molecular weight of 18.0 AMUs for a water molecule. Let's try another. Try this yourself before viewing the solution. Calculate the molecular weight of sulfuric acid, H2SO4. A sulfuric acid molecule contains two hydrogen atoms at one AMU each, plus one sulfur atom at 32.1 AMUs, did you round the atomic weight correctly or did you say 32.0, and four oxygen atoms at 16.0 AMUs apiece, which gives a total molecular weight for sulfuric acid of 98.1 AMUs. And another. Calculate the formula weight of stannic dichromate, SnCr207, taken twice. But before you do, I'd like to make a comment. The real skill in calculating molecular or formula weights correctly is not doing the arithmetic, but being able to correctly interpret the formula and determine how many of each kind of atom are actually represented in the formula. If you are having difficulty with this, go back and look at the previous lecture and try the problems presented in the workbook again. Okay, stannic dichromate. A formula unit of stannic dichromate contains one tin at 118.7, four chromiums at 52.0 each, and 14 oxygens at 16.0 each. Here's how I got that. There is just one atom of tin. The subscript of tin is understood to be one. Remember that the two outside the parentheses refers to everything inside the parentheses and only what is inside the parentheses. There are two chromiums inside the parentheses, so two chromiums taken twice means that we have a total of four chromiums. There are seven oxygens inside the parentheses, and we have to take these seven oxygens twice, so this gives us a total of 14 oxygens. Adding up the total masses of all these atoms produces a formula weight of 550.7 AMUs. This is a skill that you absolutely must master to proceed su successfully in this course. So if you still are not close to 100% on this, try working more practice problems, either from your current textbook or from the workbook that accompanies this course. The next lecture will deal with what is probably the most important single topic in the entire series of lectures, the mole.